Last week, we covered the first carrier battle in history, one of the most important events of the Pacific War, which directly tied with the American victory at Midway. Thus, the Battle of the Coral Sea and the downfall of Operation MO were such important events that they warranted their own episode. But in that week, other developments were also unfolding as well. The most important one was the Battle of Corregidor, leading up to the events of this week in which the whole of the Philippines were finally taken. So join us as we look at General Homer's last offensive and the final surrender of the Filipino defenders. Your continued support allows us to expand our work, and we're so grateful for that. We're always eager to create more videos for you, and we think that you'll enjoy our documentaries on post-World War II history over on the Cold War channel, and our Wizards and Warriors channel, which focuses on the fantasy and sci-fi lore battle documentaries. We've also recently started a TikTok channel, and would appreciate your support on that new platform. Consider subscribing to all three, the links are in the description and pinned comment. Thanks for being with us. April had been a good month for General Homer and the Japanese forces based in the Philippines. After receiving some strong reinforcements, he had finally broken through the American defenses on the Bataan Peninsula, culminating with the surrender of General King on April 9th. Further operations against the Visayas had also been carried out successfully, and he now counted with a foothold from where to launch his invasion of Mindanao. Now the last obstacle that he had to overcome was the American island fortress of Corregidor. There, General Wainwright maintained control over the Manila Bay, with a garrison of some 13,000 men, including the 4th Marines Regiment of Colonel Samuel Howard. Known to the Americans as the Gibraltar of the East, Corregidor had been heavily fortified across its history, yet its defences had not been improved since World War I. It nonetheless boasted a formidable armament of some 56 coastal guns and mortars, 48 machine guns, 28 3-inch guns, and 10 Sperry searchlights. This constituted the harbour defences, which were led by General Moore in an effort to protect the beaches and execute inshore patrols. Furthermore, his responsibility not only included Corregidor, but also the three other fortified islands that protected Manila Bay. Moore had also tried to update these fortifications prior to the war, but he had had little time and thus wasn't able to correct the most important weaknesses of the harbour defences, their vulnerability against air attacks and on their landward flanks. In result, Corregidor had been regularly bombarded from December 28th to January 6th by the strong air forces commanded by Lieutenant General Obata Hideyoshi, suffering heavy damage and a morale drop, but luckily keeping the armament of the island unscathed. The defenders were also suffering from food shortages and living on 30 ounces of food per day. When bombardments killed horses of the cavalry, the men would drag the carcasses down to the mess hall for consumption. Additionally, Japanese artillery from Cavite intermittently shelled the defenders' positions during the month of February, although failing to cause severe damage. By March 15th, new reinforcements arrived to start a heavier bombardment from Pico de Loro, which caused much damage to Forts Frank and Drum. With the fall of Bataan, however, General Homer could now place his heavy artillery on the slopes of the Maravelli's Mountains, from where he could now start inflicting some real damage over the American defences. Meanwhile, to the south, General Sharp was also working tirelessly to make all defences ready on Mindanao. There, he had three poorly trained and inadequately equipped Filipino divisions, with few artillery pieces, but an additional division being recently organised at Cagayan. Sharp divided the defence of Mindanao into five sectors, with the most important being the Cotabato Davao sector, where the Japanese had already landed back in December 1941. Whereas Corregidor's importance lay with its ability to control Manila Bay, MacArthur desired to use Mindanao as a base for his reconquest of the Philippines, so keeping American control of the island was also of the utmost importance. As for the Japanese, they kept a small presence over Davao with the battalion strong Miura detachment under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Miura Toshio. Since his arrival to the island, Miura had tried to extend his control into the interior, but even despite the air and artillery support, he hadn't been successful in this endeavour. 
With the fall of Panay and Cebu, however, Homa managed to finally seize the island with a coordinated attack from three directions, so Miura was ordered to move to the town of Digos, from where he would strike towards the Sairei Highway. At the same time, the Kawaguchi detachment was to land at Cotabato on the west coast, where a small force would advance east to link with Miura's troops, while the bulk of the detachment pushed north towards Kagayen. Finally, the Kawamura detachment was to land at the head of Makahala Bay, with a small force striking west to meet Kawaguchi's men, while the rest of the detachment marched south along the Sairei Highway. Thus, Homa planned to encircle and neutralize the American defenders across three fronts. On April 26th, the operation was set in motion, with the departure from Cebu of the Kawaguchi detachment, followed by Karamura from Panay five days later. At dawn on April 29th, the day of Hirohito's birthday, Kawaguchi's men began to land at Kotobato and Parang. Whereas they could come ashore unharmed at Kotobato, Kawaguchi saw much more opposition at Parang. There, the 1st Regiment of Colonel Calixto Duque had established solid defensive positions at the beaches, which enabled him to hold the town for more than six hours. Despite initially landing without problem at Kotobato, Kawaguchi also saw heavy resistance when entering the city, only managing to push the Filipinos back with the aid of Japanese aircraft. Soon, both Calixto's men and the 101st Division found themselves encircled and had to withdraw inland. In the meantime, Miura had moved against Digos in strength, engaging the Filipino forces there and starting his advance west towards the Sairei Highway. The defenders, led by Lieutenant Colonel Reed Graves, opposed the Japanese advance stubbornly and got to effectively slow them down with mortar fire. On April 30th, though, Kawaguchi began his advance eastwards towards Miura's position, both moving over land and sailing up the river. This was very dangerous, as the Japanese could rapidly set up roadblocks in front of the retreating men of the 101st Division. And this is exactly what the invaders would do, capturing Pickett and forcing the Filipinos to move north and away from the roads. From there, Kawaguchi then wanted to advance on Kabakan, where he would completely cut off Graves' men. A race would thus start for the heart of the sector. Meanwhile, the Japanese would also start to advance from Parang towards Malabang, which was held by the 61st Regiment of Colonel Eugene Mitchell. There, the defenders immediately withdrew to some better defensive positions behind the Mataling River. When Kawaguchi landed at the city, action immediately opened along the Mataling line. The Filipinos held on for a few hours, but having suffered heavy casualties, they started to give way against the incessant hammering of Kawaguchi's men. Desperately, Mitchell launched a counterattack against his weakened rear, but the arrival of Japanese artillery and the reluctance of some Filipino soldiers to attack ended up forcing his men to retreat. The following day, the 61st was engaged again by Kawaguchi's men, suffering heavy casualties and having to continue its withdrawal northwards. Although they were later reinforced by elements of the 84th Regiment, a third Japanese assault finally overran and routed the defenders. Making his way to the rear, Mitchell reorganized the remainder of his forces with a detachment of the 81st Regiment, but hot on their heels, the Japanese struck and finally annihilated the Filipino force, capturing Mitchell in the process. Now, Kawaguchi aimed his detachment against the town of Ganassi, where the 73rd Regiment, led by Lieutenant Colonel Robert Vasey, stood as his last obstacle on the way to Kagian. On May 2nd, Kawaguchi's vanguard started a preliminary assault, which rapidly forced the defenders to withdraw towards Bacolod, though the Japanese would not keep up their pressure. In the meantime, after carrying out successful delaying actions against the Miura detachment, Graves was ordered to withdraw immediately or else get annihilated by the enemy. By a hair's breadth, the Filipinos would get to escape through Kabakan just as the town was starting to be attacked by the Japanese. They would then set up defensive positions along the Saire Highway, successfully holding their ground against the invaders until the end of the campaign. Early on May 3rd, Kawaguchi resumed his advance towards Kagayan, but was abruptly stopped by the successful delaying actions of the 73rd. One IJA tank attempted to cross a stream and was knocked out by a 2.95-inch mountain gun while the 73rd shot out the IJA halting them. 
yet despite them, the Japanese would manage to start a renewed assault as they received artillery support, and that sent the defenders packing. With this victory, Kawaguchi had consolidated his control over southern and western Mindanao, only leaving the Filipinos in the north standing. There, however, the Karamura detachment had landed at two points during the early hours of May 3rd. Supported by Japanese destroyers and aircraft, Karamura's forces quickly came ashore and successfully pushed back the defenders. Only a strong counterattack by the 103rd Regiment almost managed to drive back the invaders into the sea, but the retreat of the other elements of the 102nd Division ended up forcing the regiment to withdraw as well. At this point, General Sharp sent forward his reserves to halt the Japanese advance along the Sairi Highway. By nightfall, new defensive positions were thus established parallel to the Mangima Canyon, with three regiments holding the town of Dalirig and two regiments defending Puntian. Luckily for them, Karamura decided not to continue his advance, so the defenders could dig in at their new positions. But before we can conclude the invasion of Mindanao, we have to look back to Corregidor. With his heavy artillery now in place on the slopes of the Maravelli's mountains and along the shores of Cap Caban, Homa was preparing his final assault against Corregidor. The 4th Division of General Kitano was selected to carry out two consecutive amphibious attacks, reinforced with the 7th Tank Regiment and one battalion of mountain artillery, while at the same time, the 16th Division would launch a feint attack from Cavite against Forts Frank and Drum. For the assault, the Japanese artillery had the most important task, starting their incessant barrage of the island on April 10th. This force, led by Major General Kitajima Kinio, included 18 batteries with some 116 field pieces and had to neutralize the enemy's guns, destroy Corregidor's installations, sink vessels in the bay, and allow Japanese aircraft to get close to the island with the destruction of all anti-aircraft guns and short-range batteries. It would also drown out the noise of the transport's engines as they entered Manila Bay through the North Channel, successfully allowing the invaders to assemble some 60 transports at the bay by April 22nd. During the 27 days of siege, Kitajima's artillery unleashed hell upon the defenders with great effectiveness, raining such a heavy amount of fire over them that most of the beach defenses ended up demolished, the anti-aircraft guns destroyed, and the land cratered. The shelling never really stopped, making it impossible to repair or replace any of the defenses. The devastation caused by the Japanese was also accompanied by several aerial bombardments, which were carried out by the 22nd Air Brigade. Emboldened by the success of the artillery, the pilots came in at lower altitudes and bombed much more accurately, thus increasing the damage to the American defenses. By the start of May, large sections of Corregidor lay shrouded under a dense cloud of smoke and dust, and now the even heavier pre-assault bombardment was commencing. With such a barrage, the only place safe for the Americans was in the Melinta tunnels, but they could not fight back from there. Concentrated fire over the narrow trail of the island hinted where the assault was going to take place, but the harshness of the attacks left this area really vulnerable. With each passing day, the intensity of the bombardment increased to the disbelief of the demoralized defenders, and by May 5th, the defenses of Corregidor had truly been destroyed with dust laying so heavy over the island that the men could not see beyond their position. That night, Kitano's assault was commencing and the fall of Corregidor was coming close to fruition. Surprisingly, the defenders valiantly employed the few remaining batteries they had against the invaders, managing to sink a number of boats and inflicting hundreds of casualties. Then, after running to the island in the dark, the 61st Regiment came ashore further east than expected, immediately starting to push west towards Melinta Hill and south against Monkey Point. By the early hours of May 6th, the Japanese had taken the position of Battery Denver, swiftly defeating the light opposition of the US Marines and threatening the Melinta tunnels. While Moore tried to reinforce the entrance to the tunnels under heavy artillery fire, the Japanese fended off three consecutive counterattacks against their position. Desperately, Colonel Howard sent forward his last reserves, a provisional battalion of 500 marines, sailors and soldiers, which started a last counterattack at 0600. 
to the surprise of the Japanese, the obstinate and bold attack of the Americans managed to make gains, but it was eventually stalled and the defenders had to retreat. At this point, however, the situation was very bad for the invaders as well. Several ammunition crates never made the landings, and as a result, several Japanese attacks and counterattacks were made using bayonets. The retaliation of the American batteries had destroyed some 31 vessels, preventing Kitano from launching the second wave of landings by the 37th Regiment unless Malinta Hill was first taken. Despite this, the 61st had now assembled with its tanks and artillery and was starting a coordinated assault that managed to rapidly rout the Marine defenders. By 10, the situation was hopeless for the Americans. Knowing that a wholesale slaughter would occur if the Japanese got to the tunnels, General Wainwright had no other choice but to surrender the four fortified islands in Manila Bay. While he travelled to Bataan, the Japanese actually got to seize the Malinta tunnels, leaving the men there to their mercy. Despite Wainwright's initial reluctance to surrender the rest of the Philippines, General Homer finally forced him to order the Visayan Mindanao forces to surrender as well, or else the 11,000 men in Corregidor would be brutally executed. At Mindanao, May 6th had actually seen Karamura resume his offensive with an attack against Delirig, yet he made little progress against the defenders. Only on May 9th could the town be taken, as the 62nd Regiment retreated in disarray, but this effectively breached the Mangima Line and left northern Mindanao in the hands of the invaders. General Sharp was in a difficult position. If he ignored the surrender order from Wainwright, the hostages on Corregidor could be massacred, yet his men were still capable of mounting guerrilla warfare, and several smaller groups were released from his command, while the remaining defenders retreated to their mountain hideouts. Between May 10th and 15th, Wainwright's orders for surrender began to arrive to the commanders of the scattered Filipino forces. Generals Sharp and Chinueth, among many others, decided to surrender to avoid the slaughter of the Corregidor garrison, but many officers refused to carry out these orders and continued to fight as guerrilla groups, mostly made of Filipino soldiers. Most of these guerrillas would continue to fight until the liberation of the Philippines, proving to be pivotal for the operations that would take place there in the future. The last place to surrender would be the island of Negros, where the Filipino forces mutinied against their commander and held hostage some 200 Japanese internees. Eventually, most of the Filipinos surrendered on June 3rd, but two of these battalions never surrendered at all, thus continuing the fight from the mountains. With this, however, the fall of the Philippines had been completed after six months of long resistance, and the archipelago was now in the hands of the Japanese. Homa had finally won the campaign, but Tokyo had expected this to happen by February, in two months rather than the five he had spent, so he was promptly and disgracefully relieved from his command. As for the Allies, the epic of Bataan and Corregidor would act as a beacon of hope for the future proving that the Japanese were not really unstoppable. Next episode, we will look at some of the events that we didn't get to cover in the last few weeks, primarily focusing on the final evacuation of Burma. And if you don't want to miss that episode, make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord, and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.